The title of First Dreadnought to Sink in Action is something no Navy wanted, and that's with good reason. These were expensive ships, status symbols as much as warships, the supercarriers of their day. But, of course, someone would have to lose one eventually. That the first dreadnought to be sunk was in such an embarrassing fashion probably didn't make the Royal Navy particularly happy. That dreadnought was HMS Audacious, laid low by a single mine. She didn't go out in a blaze of glory, she didn't fight with her German counterparts. No, Audacious was in service for about a year, at the end of which, early in the Great War, she was on the bottom. Not a great start to the war for the Royal Navy, which is saying something considering the losses of Gallipoli and Jutland. One of Audacious herself, though. Well, as always, I'll cover her design and service, though there will be very little of the latter, as you can probably guess. HMS Audacious, the fourth and last of the King George V class battleships, the first set of those, was laid down on March 23, 1911. A fairly standard construction followed, with the ship launching on September 14, 1912. Her commissioning would follow on October 15, 1913, as one of the last British dreadnoughts built prior to the Great War. The ship that entered service was, however, fairly average as these things go. The King George V class was basically an enlarged Orion, with some improvements, and they would be followed, in turn, by the extremely similar Iron Duke class. It was just how things went at that time, with the British building these ships as fast as they could. As for her technical details, then, Audacious displaced roughly 25,000 tons, which allowed her to carry a heavy broadside of 10 13.5-inch guns. These were mounted in fairly typical British style of the time, with a pair superfiring on the bow, another pair superfiring on the stern, and one amidships turret right behind the funnels. This gave Audacious a heavier weight of fire than her German rivals, both in the size of her guns and in her layout, in comparison to the on echelon layout of most German capital ships. Backing these up were 16 4-inch guns, 8 mounted in the forward superstructure, four in the aft superstructure, and four in hull-mounted casements. These were the standard British secondary gun for a good portion of their dreadnoughts, though the Iron Duke class would swap to heavier 6-inch guns. Wrapping up her weaponry, on that note, was another standard dreadnought fair. Three submerged 21-inch torpedo tubes, one on each side of the ship, and a third in the stern. Finally, and to round off her technical details, Audacious, with her heavy firepower and 12-inch armored belt, could make 21 knots. This speed was provided by 27,000 shaft horsepower, driving four shafts. And, with that done, we can move on to service history. Although there isn't much to talk about here, before her meeting with German explosives. As mentioned, Audacious entered service in October 1913. This initial service would see her do the usual training duties, working up her crew, and familiarizing them with their ship. The only thing of real note in the pre-war period was when Audacious and her sister ships represented the Royal Navy at the reopening of the Kiel Canal. That was in June 1914. Following that, Audacious would be part of test mobilizations in response to the July crisis. Then it was off to Scapa Flow to prepare for what was quickly becoming an inevitable war. When that war did kick off, Audacious was promptly put in for a much-needed refit. She remained there until October 1914, at which point she rejoined the newly reorganized Grand Fleet. This fleet was based out of Scapa Flow off the Scottish coast. The anchorage there was considered secure from German attack, and a perfect operating base as a result. However, reports of submarines in the anchorage spooked the British commander, John Jellicoe, enough to split the fleet to other bases until the defenses could be reinforced. A quick glance at Royal Oak can tell you his caution was warranted, although the U-boats of the Great War were definitely not the U-boats of the Second World War. In any case, Audacious was promptly sent to a new base on the western coast of Scotland. That was on October 16th, with the 2nd Battle Squadron, which she was a member of, moving to gunnery training later in the month. That would be her last mission. It was on the morning of October 27th that, off the coast of Ireland, 
Audacious had her fateful meeting with a German sea mine. This mine was one of 200 such weapons laid by a converted German ocean liner. That ship, the Berlin, had initially been assigned to lay her weapons off the Scottish coast. When the Grand Fleet's disorganization in the wake of Jellicoe's order left certain openings, Berlin ended up changing course. Instead of the Scottish coast, the liner would place her deadly cargo off the coast of Tory Island. This she did on the night of October 22nd, finishing around midnight on the 23rd. At this point, the Germans wisely left the area. The story of Berlin would see her leave her deadly cargo behind, attempt to raid various areas, and eventually end up in Norway. Her engines and coal gave out on her, and instead of being sunk by British action, her captain elected for internment. The liner was interned in Trondheim in November 1914, with her war over at that point. While her attempt at merchant raiding had been a dismal failure, Berlin's mine laying would prove rather more successful. Her first victim would be a merchant, Manchester Commerce. That ship struck a mine on October 26th, with her survivors rescued in the early morning of the 27th. The trawler that had picked them up set off for Ireland, arriving around 10 a.m. that day. A message about the mines was promptly sent out, working its way through various channels, where it eventually reached Jellicoe's desk at 2 p.m. Unfortunately for Audacious, she had left for gunnery training on the 26th of October. As the trawler carried the survivors of the merchant to Irish shores, Audacious was already approaching her fate. At 8.50 a.m., October 27, 1914, HMS Audacious struck a German mine, only about a mile away from where Manchester Commerce had been sunk. That single mine caused catastrophic damage. Exploding beneath her port engine room, it disabled that engine and began to rapidly flood the area. The port engine room was flooded almost immediately. The central engine room, meanwhile, began to take on water as well. It was slow enough flooding that counter-flooding of starboard compartments kept Audacious to a relatively minor 9-degree list. However, the emphasis must be put on relatively. With the heavy seas that day, Audacious was not in a stable state. The battleship remained afloat and able to make steam, but her speed was limited to 9 knots. The situation was made worse by the fact the British assumed Audacious had been hit by a torpedo. They were, as yet, unaware of the minefield. Making the paranoid but reasonable assumption that the battleship had been hit by a U-boat, her captain raised a submarine warning. The result of this would see the other members of her squadron continuing on and moving away. One of them, HMS Monarch, would later report a false submarine sighting at around 11 a.m. As for Audacious, she was left with the light cruiser HMS Liverpool for support. Her captain, Cecil Dampier, kept the battleship moving at her 9 knot maximum speed. He believed that the flooding was under control enough that, in spite of the rough seas, he could reach the nearby Irish coast and beach his crippled dreadnought. While he did so, Jellicoe scrambled everything that could float and sent it her way. Every destroyer and tug in the area converged on Audacious, while the battleships remained a healthy distance away, out of U-boat-related paranoia. While the battleships kept away, that didn't mean only small ships came to her aid. RMS Olympic, steaming nearby, had picked up Audacious's distress call. Commodore Herbert Haddock was a man who couldn't stay away. He had previously pushed his stately liner to the absolute limit and beyond in 1912 in an attempt to come to the aid of her stricken sister. While Olympic and Haddock had been too far away to help Titanic, they were not too far away to help Audacious. So it was that Olympic took station off Audacious, with curious American passengers snapping pictures and pointing at the stricken dreadnought. All the while, Dampier and his crew worked tirelessly to save their ship. The captain kept the ship moving for about 15 miles, 24 kilometers, as the flooding steadily progressed. The already flooded port engine room was soon joined by the central and starboard rooms around 10.50 that morning. Audacious drifted to a halt at that point as she lost all steam power. With the battleship wallowing in the heavy seas, boats from Liverpool and Olympic set about taking off most of her crew. 
This was not an easy task in those conditions, and I have a healthy respect for the British sailors in those boats. From 11 a.m. to about 2 p.m., those brave men went about their duty. Most of the battleship's crew would, in the process, be taken to safety aboard the other ships. That said, some 250 men were left aboard the battleship to try and combat the flooding. While they worked this grim task, Haddock suggested he take Audacious under tow. Olympic was, after all, quite a large and powerful ship. Not really one designed to tug a dreadnought around, but in the lack of any other options, it shouldn't be surprising that Dampier agreed. At 2 p.m., with the last of the non-essential crew taken off, the destroyer HMS Fury helped rig the tow line. Her captain, Charles Sumner, displayed skill and determination in rigging that line. Unfortunately, it would prove to be wasted effort. Audacious was nearly uncontrollable at this point, and efforts to steer the ship would see the line part soon after it was tied. Further attempts to tie up Liverpool and the newly arrived collier Thornhill also failed. Fury and Sumner deserve some recognition, even if the efforts failed, for working to rig all those tow lines. By the point the towing efforts were abandoned, the message about the minefield had reached Jellicoe. He was prompt in reacting to it, ordering the pre-dreadnought HMS Exmouth out to take up towing duty. This ship would have been more suited to the task than Olympic or Liverpool. The battleship would unfortunately not arrive in time. At 5 p.m., all but 50 of Audacious's remaining crew was taken off. They would be joined an hour later by the captain and the rest of the crew, with the sun rapidly setting. Now, at this point, Audacious was still afloat. The list was getting worse, but the ship was seemingly in no real danger of sinking outright. With Exmouth rapidly approaching, it might have been possible to save the ship. Or at least it would have seemed that way to those watching the Dreadnought settle deeper in the water. However, as the pre-Dreadnought drew ever closer, Audacious began her final plunge. At 8.45 p.m. on October 27th, she suddenly heeled over and capsized. The nearly new battleship remained afloat, inverted, until 9 p.m. At that point, a massive explosion shook the area. Audacious vanished in a cloud of smoke, with wreckage flying as high as 300 feet in the air. Two following explosions would complete the process, sending the abandoned wreck to the bottom. This was likely caused by shells shifting and falling in her magazine spaces, which would have ignited the incredibly explosive cordite. Audacious was, as such, the first case of a British capital ship suffering a catastrophic magazine detonation in the Great War. I wish I could say the only one, but Jutland is right there. Regardless, as Audacious went down, it was with a shocking lack of death. The only man to die during the sinking wasn't even a member of her own crew. A piece of the battleship's armor plate, launched by the initial explosion, killed a petty officer on Liverpool. William Burgess had the unfortunate luck to be hit by that armor a good 800 yards away from the battleship. It's almost a miracle that, his unfortunate fate aside, no one else died. That is something to be proud of for the men who took off Audacious's crew. However, that same crew would not be able to talk about their experiences. The cover-up began immediately. In an effort to prevent the Germans from taking advantage of the momentary weakness in the Grand Fleet, the British attempted to suppress any news of the sinking. A futile gesture, really. The Americans aboard Olympic could hardly be coerced to stay quiet. Many had taken pictures, and those were spread around in short order. By late November, the Germans were aware of the loss of the battleship. As the liner Berlin was being interned in Norway, her greatest success was making the rounds in Germany. The story of HMS Audacious comes to an end then, with even the cover-up, which lasted until the end of the war, being something of a failure. Not a happy story for a battleship lost so soon into her active career. A follow-up investigation indicated the ship wasn't at action stations, and that faulty seals and broken pipes contributed to her sinking. Maybe that's true. Regardless of exactly how she sank, Audacious is an embarrassment that the Royal Navy wouldn't soon forget. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, 
and I'll see you in the next one.